Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is Morteza Hajizadeh, your host from Critical Theory Channel. And today I'm honored to have Professor Ross uh, Melnick with me. Dr. Ross Melnick is a professor of film and media studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he's here to talk about a wonderful book he wrote uh, called Hollywood's Embassies, How Movie Theaters Projected American Power Around the World. The book was published in 2022 by Yale University Press. Oh, sorry, it's not Yale University. It's... uh, Columbia, Columbia University Press. <laughs> yeah, don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Columbia University Press, yes. Uh, Ross, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little about yourself, uh, your field of expertise, how you became interested in film and media studies? Sure. Uh, my area of expertise is in film media history, global film exhibition, and the history of the entertainment industry in general. Um, my background actually is in uh, working in the industry, and then I left it to become an academic and to study it, uh, you know, both to teach and research uh, about the changes in our industry, um, historically as well as contemporarily. And uh, what led you to write this book, Hollywood Embassies? And it's a large book, and it would be great if we could also talk about the structure of the book, because you take us almost on a tour around the world. <laughs> Yeah, well, this book is sort of like an accident. And I think some of the most exciting books, at least in your own life, should be sort of happy accidents. Um, This book began as an offshoot of my first book called American Showman, which was on the history of um, Samuel Roxy Rothfeld and the kind of the birth of the entertainment industry, which was the combining of film, music and broadcasting in the 20s in New York. And one of the figures that uh, I kept seeing was a man named Major Bose, who is a legendary broadcaster in his own right and also had run the Capitol Theater uh, with and after Roxy. Well, he was being sent by MGM to Paris to operate the Gaumont Cinema there. And I couldn't figure out why would MGM send one of its employees to Paris to help run cinemas there. And that led me to the Gaumont Metro Agreement and this agreement between Gaumont and MGM and Lowe's uh, to operate both as distribution and exhibition um, uh, operations uh, under the aegis of of the newly formed MGM and its parent company, Lowe's Incorporated. And as I was looking at Paris and thinking, well, where else this might this have happened? I started thinking about Paramount theaters that I had read about in London and then started finding Paramount theaters all around the world and finding Metro cinemas, because the difference was in the United States, those theaters were known as Lowe's, but overseas they were Metro's. And so I suddenly was finding Metro's everywhere. And then as I was working on the other book, American Showman, I kept researching this project. And so when I published American Showman in 2012, um, I thought I would take a few years and finish up this project, which at the time was about 12 countries. Um, I thought, oh, that's that's good. It's really grown. It's 12 countries. Uh, by the time I finished this and it came out in 2022, it's up to three dozen countries where Hollywood operated its foreign cinemas. And so the structure of the book f- is sort of interesting because I had originally intended it to be a long kind of chronological history where you could see, oh, in the 19, late 1920s, Paramount was operating in Tokyo and they were operating in Sao Paulo and they were operating in London. And you'd have a comparative view of the kind of the growth of the studios. But what I realized was looking at something regionally was kind of a little bit more exciting because you started to see the way that Hollywood operated and how they organized uh, regions in which countries really had nothing to do with one another. They would play something like Cuba in conversation with Trinidad. Now, they're both in the Caribbean, but they have linguistic, cultural, even political differences. And this really didn't matter to Hollywood because it needs to organize things geographically. So that odd formation in which one typically man, was placed in charge of this large geography, actually allowed me to rethink what I was doing. And so instead of doing this very long kind of periodized um, chunks of history, I instead broke them into six areas, um, geographical areas. So there was, for instance, one section on Europe, one on Australasia, one on Africa, one on Asia, et cetera. And so that allowed me to look at that timeline uh, chronologically, mostly, but to look at things in terms of a comparative regional focus. And that's a kind of interesting growing focus, I think, actually, within film media studies is to think about things, obviously, on the local level, um, but also not just on the national level, but to think about them as in terms of regions, um, the Middle East, for example. 
so the book is broken up into these uh, these regions, and then it how that played out, how the American expansion uh, through cinemas existed in those regions is part of the story uh, that I'm telling here. And I really like the, t- the title, Cultural Embassies. What do you mean by cultural embassies? And what are the... It's, so they're not necessarily only... The implication is that they're not necessarily only places of entertainment. So can you tell us about the connotation of the term? And what do you mean by that, cultural embassies? Yeah, well, this very loaded term is on purpose. It's to, to kind of evoke the, the similarity to an official embassy, but to really understand these foreign cinemas that Hollywood owned in, in other countries is thinking about them as kind of soft power institutions that enabled a kind of embassy function. And what I mean by that is an official embassy is uh, run by an American citizen, often employing local employees from the actual location. It's there to relate to local businesses. It's there to relate to local consumers. It's there to uh, ex- expand and attract people to um, American ideology. That's the official embassy. The cultural embassy works sort of similarly. It's run by an American citizen. It employs local uh, employees. And it's also there to relate to local businesses. It's there to actually interact and interface with local politicians. Um, it's also there to collect research and data and to understand local markets, which is good to report back to the U.S. State Department, the Commerce Department, so that uh, businesses, certainly film distribution and even other businesses will know a certain market. So the cultural embassy works in a couple of different ways. And it's also a way of thinking about movie theaters as far more than buildings. And this is part of a kind of consistent theme in my work, which is that I think we all think of movie theaters as a place of entertainment and excitement. And we like to go to them because we like to watch movies. And there's so much more transacted in a movie theater than just walking into a building to see a movie. You know, I can go on to many, many examples from the silent to the contemporary period. But, but with these foreign cinemas, you're talking about uh, racial relations, cultural relations. You're talking about the kind of hybridity of the local and the foreign architectural differences, technological expansion, you know, all kinds of American companies like uh, carrier air conditioning and seating companies and technology, all of the things that America, the United States is trying to transmit overseas. It's doing that through its films, but when it actually operates a theater, it's really transmitting a kind of idea. One of those ideas, of course, is a kind of cross-class, middle-class fantasy, which is that anyone could go and be treated like a king and queen to come into one of these theaters. And it was also, especially in the post-war period, many of these cinemas really were kind of a a rebuttal to uh, the growth of communism and socialism in other countries. And so the United States was very happy to have Hollywood building these cinemas, it was also very happy to interface with them to understand what was going on um, locally in these cinemas and to see how they could actually expand things. And the last thing I would say about it being a cultural embassy is that there wasn't just fiction films being shown there because a Hollywood cinema, unless there was local legislation in place, typically showed American produced newsreels which meant that information and news as well as entertainment was all being projected inside that space. And so it was this combination of this uh, kind of entertainment, infotainment, as well as news generation that was happening inside these theaters. So the notion of a movie theater as a cultural embassy is the idea that on the streetscape of a city, you suddenly have a very American uh, brand uh, sitting on the street. And that's well before, you know, McDonald's and Starbucks and many other American chains. This is typically the first um, American brand existing on a street in an international city. It was a very American operation and everyone would know that it was an US owned building um, encouraging people to enter into it and have a very American experience. We think that's a very commonplace idea now if you go into KFC in London or if you go into, you know, it's, we all are very used to that. You go to Disneyland in Paris. Um, but this is the first time in which uh, a very uh, Americanized branded entertainment arrived to a piece of architecture and encouraged an American experience in a foreign country. And that was one of the things that concerned people. For instance, uh, this is, if you're talking about the 20s and 30s, there was a growing concern um, within England, for instance, that the world was going to become, even its own Commonwealth and former colonies and current colonies was going to become less British, if you will. And then America would begin colonizing the mind and colonizing the kind of uh, cultural attractions. And so, again, the cultural embassy functions in a variety of different ways to attract people to the United States um, technology, ideology, consumerism, and all through 
bringing people into that movie theater in a very public way on the street and then bringing them to an environment that would attract, entertain, and convince them that the U.S. method was the one um, that would bring the the greatest value for their entertainment. Uh, That was quite interesting because I always assumed that you know, Brandon, like McDonald was more or less the same one that uh, kind of spread around the world. Um, so, but when did this kind of first wave of Hollywood's effort to take over cinemas over, over the world start? Was it in the 1920s? Yeah, th- this whole period began in the 1920s. And, and it's not an accident that it happens after World War, world war One because you have a lot of investment coming in from Wall Street. And part of the anyone putting investment into Wall Street is that you're trying to, uh, you're trying to expand uh, a company. You're trying to increase earnings year over year. Well, one of the things ways you do that, of course, is through expanding markets. You have to open new markets. And so initially they were opening uh, exchanges and branch offices and foreign offices in other countries. But what they discovered, no surprise, is that not every exhibitor was that happy to have uh, Hollywood films at the rental rates that Hollywood wanted to distribute them. And so as they went into more and more markets where there was local competition and local domination, those exhibitors would try to exact uh, much better rental rates for themselves. And Hollywood would sort of realize that if you go into a place where you need uh, access, one of the best ways to create kind of quote unquote first run uh, releases or at least a premiere run of your film in a foreign market is to own the theater themselves yourself. You don't have to negotiate with a local exhibitor to make sure you have uh, the first run of Ben Hur for six weeks. You can own your own building. You can then advertise um, that film for six weeks yourself. You can say Ben Hur will be for six weeks, and that's where another term that I use in the book is sort of important. I use this term shop window, and the shop window is this British trade journal kind of nomenclature, which essentially means what it sounds like, which is that essentially you are presenting the film in the way in which the studio wants it to be presented. So in this case, uh, if you're, if you have a shop window that's in London, that would be the Plaza um, for Paramount or be the Empire for MGM. They wanted to advertise to obviously London. This is the best way to see this film. This is the premier presentation of this. And they wanted to do a variety of different kinds of influences. One is You want to influence people in London that this is the best place to see it. You want to uh, basically demonstrate that higher ticket prices and a higher class of entertainment will will be a better result for local exhibitors, which is intended to push ticket prices higher. It's also intended to bring people from Leeds and Liverpool and Birmingham to come to London to see how MGM actually presented that film at uh, at at the Empire. So that it, pres- it, again, it was there to influence, uh, again, a broad range of the industry. And it was there, of course, to attract um, local moviegoers to a premier MGM experience. So it presented, again, like a, a kind of shop window. This was the, the sort of the mannequin in the window. This is the premier presentation. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is we're talking about prints, 35 millimeter prints. We're not talking about digital. So one of the things you got by going to the Empire to see Ben-Hur, um, well, actually, it's a little early, but let's say we're going to see uh, for Wizard of Oz is that you're seeing it before it has scratches because it's the first time that print gets screened. You know, the neck, that print then gets to go to the next theater and then the next theater and the next theater. So one of the things is about the sort of run system is, is the premiere presentation of these films also meant uh, not just the best projection sound and lighting and everything else inside the theater, but it was also about the fact that the film was still in premiere a presentation shape. It had just come from their own distribution offices um, in England. So there's all this kind of ways that it's wrapped up in this um, in terms of what that first look um, was all about. And uh, let's talk about England. Uh, so how did Paramount's uh, expansion of cinemas in Birmingham come for? How did it go? I think it was a lot of backlash there against them. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the funny thing about the, the shop window policy was that it came in actually as a result of what happened in Birmingham, which is namely that, you know, Paramount uh, opened the plaza and then MGM had the, uh, the empire. But after Paramount opened the plaza, they got designs, as they did in the United States, on expanding to other cities throughout England. Um, and as an important English speaking market, they wanted to have theaters in other cities. 
Um, so they op- they leased uh, the Scala from a man named Saul Levy in 1926 in, in Birmingham, and they thought this will be fine. We'll we'll have two cinemas here, and I'm sure they expected to go on to other cities. What they discovered was the National Trade Organization, the Cinematograph Exhibitors Association, was outraged because. Uh, American films were already dominating British cinemas, but the one thing they didn't want to lose was the British cinemas themselves. And so they felt that this was the bridge too far or the final bridge, if you will, which is that if American cinema, American films are going to take over the screens, if American companies are going to actually begin to buy up, lease, operate cinemas throughout the country, local competition would be destroyed. There inevitably the British cinema industry would literally would be wiped off the map. And so what they decided to do was to boycott Paramount. So the trade organization said, we will effectively across the country not show another Paramount film until you you return that lease to Saul Levy and get out of the exhibition business. You can have the plaza, that's your shop window, but you cannot take over the rest of the country. And so that was a real line in the sand. And it was an important moment in this whole expansion, which was an attempt by local exhibitors to push back against um, what Hollywood wanted to do. And so Paramount did, they relented because obviously it was far more important for them to have distribution of their films than it was to operate cinemas. So they gave back those, those cinemas and they returned to a largely distribution only plan. I will say that in the thirties, Paramount eventually built opulent cinemas throughout England, typically one in each city as their own kind of shop windows at Leeds and Liverpool and Manchester, et cetera. But for the moment, that was a real kind of a moment where I think Hollywood understood that there's going to be pushback. And they would find that actually over the next, well, almost 90 years of operation um, in international markets, which was that some people were very excited to have Hollywood come in and some people were really, really furious. And especially local exhibitors who were always concerned about competition from much better healed um, companies, which were all supported in most cases from either uh, Wall Street financing or from being publicly traded companies with a seemingly unending amount of money. So that was a, a moment. So that enabled them sort of retrench and so um, Paramount and MGM underneath its company, its parent company Lowe's, they kept with this shop window model. They would open one in Tokyo and one in Sao Paulo and maybe one in Buenos Aires. It was 20th Century Fox, honestly, that had a very different idea. Um, and that's Fox's idea was uh, buy chains on mass. You know, you don't have to fight it out to get your, your films into a, into a, uh, a theater chain if you own them. Um, so after investing, for instance, in Gaumont British in 1929, Fox opened, uh, excuse me, Fox purchased Hoyt's Theatres in 1930, and then six years later purchased a half interest and eventually a whole interest in amalgamated theatres in, in New Zealand. So um, that was, a, again, a very different idea. But the original shop window idea was have one major cinema in each international market where you could, again, put on the premiere presentation of a film. You could uh, tie up with local retailers. You could advertise on uh, on banners and bus stops, and you could um, kind of have a big launch of a film that mostly replicated the way that Hollywood launched films in the United States. It just marketed, literally marketed the same way. It had the same showmanship, exploitation methods. It would just produce in foreign markets with these cinemas. Uh, and you mentioned New Zealand. Am I right to assume that look, uh, the expansion of cinemas everywhere in the world was contentious? There were backlash. There were back, a lot of backlashes against it. But am I right to assume that in Australia and New Zealand it was a little bit maybe a smoother process? It's a very you know Australia and New Zealand is a very interesting case. Um, so I'll just talk about the, there are little difference. Yeah. So I'll jump them just briefly. So the Australian difference uh, from New Zealand is that in 1930, there was uh, this combination of Greater Union and Hoyts. They were kind of uh, almost at a booking combine. And so there was a lot of conversation about, and they were both backed by the um, ESNA Bank. So they had a lot, it was a lot of debt, it was the beginning of the depression. There was a great amount of debt. And so what what the bank did was essentially sold off Hoyts to 20th Century Fox, or at that point it was just still Fox, um, which was taking on huge amounts of debt from buying the Roxy Theater in New York, investing in Gaumont British, eventually from Amalgamated. And so that was a, a, a which really secured for Fox um, one of the two major theater chains um, in Australia. The uh, and it was and it really was something that 
they maintained for 52 years. Fox owned that chain from 1930 to 1982. For, for a very small investment, um, Fox got a heck of a return over the next half century. And six years later, they were kind of kicking around, uh, trying to figure out how to get into the New Zealand market, which was much smaller, but growing. And the Moodabees, which were uh, a, a, an immigrant family um, that was looking for a way to kind of uh, push its way into the market. It had been a small company, but with Fox's money and with the guaranteed distribution of, of Fox films, uh, amalgamated theaters became a, a major market, a major player in the New Zealand market, especially um, around Auckland. So that was a big deal for them. And so that sort of sewed up, if you will, half a century of Fox having one of two major theater chains in both of these countries um, for literally half a century. And so what that did was, and you were asking about sort of pushback, yes and no. So the part of the issue is, is that obviously there was a great sense of being a kind of British Commonwealth and a sort of a, a large amount of wanting to have a certain kind of um, British pride, right, in certain terms of the films that were coming in. But there was also in a massive amount of excitement about Hollywood films. And so people were, on one hand, uh, not that excited about having the U.S. quote unquote invasion into these markets. On the other hand, Hollywood was ascendant in the 1930s, especially with the coming of sound. And so there wasn't a tremendous sense of, um, uh, I don't know, a kind of xenophobia about Hollywood's presence. And so Hoyts then did something very tricky, which was essentially to kind of act like um, Fox didn't exist. Hoyts would still advertise itself essentially as an Australian exhibition chain, even though it was principally owned by a U.S. company. And Amalgamated was a little bit better off that way. That for many years um, they were still the they were still um, fifty percent owned by a, a well known New Zealand family, and therefore they could have a local New Zealand presence, especially when there were questions from uh, either the government offices or questions from the trade organizations. They would say, "No, no, we're we're a New Zealand company." Um, and in truth, the Mutabi family worked. Um, for, throughout the time. So even when the purchase came in in 36, and then later when Fox uh, took a whole 100% ownership of Amalgamated, the Mutabi family was employed. So there was a kind of consistency. And the same with Australia, with the Turnbulls, you know, Ernest and Dale Turnbull, you have this, you sort of have familial presence. And I think it gave a kind of um, a local face, if you will, to um, an otherwise very American story of, of how exhibition expanded. And, and I think the other thing that, that's that's worth noting is that um, when um, there began to be a turn towards the excitement about New Zealand filmmakers and Australian filmmakers in the 70s and 80s, um, that was fine because Hollywood had already established itself in terms of distribution. I think one of the things it really wanted to do was, um, and I, I, I think it's you can kind of see it, Fox pledged a lot to play Australian-made films and then really, and then Hoyts really didn't. And so it really was about establishing a, another important market for Hollywood in both of these areas and principally here, of course, for Fox. Uh, Latin America, that was one of the most interesting chapters of the book. You talk about uh, labor issues there. You talk about Cuba. So uh, let's, let's talk about Latin America a little bit. Uh, you, you make the point that these, 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 stab- these new establishments sort of exploit the cheap labor that was available there. So can you talk about how that expansion of Hollywood into Latin America worked? And then we'll talk about Cuba a little bit as well, because you talk about this Warner and Paramount entering Cuba. How, how What happened to them after the Cuban Revolution? Well, let me start with the, the, the Cuban example is really uh, fascinating. And I'll say mm-hmm. if you want even larger uh, expansion on, on this sort of phenomenon, I would look at uh, Megan Feeney's book on 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 Hollywood and, and, and Cuba. And, but um, in terms of the theaters, I think what's, what's, what's interesting is that um, Hollywood had its eyes on Havana from the 1920s and thirties, you know, Warner brothers had been trying to build cinemas there since the late twenties. And there's no surprise that uh, there was a lot of interest in us investment in Cuba in, during that period. It wasn't until uh, the forties though, that Paramount really was able to establish a theater chain um, that ran across uh, Havana and Camagüey and, and was able to establish a theater chain um, in Cuba. And, and that's 
one piece of this, and that was part of Paramount's other in, in, interests and investments as well in places like Jamaica. So it was not just interested in, um, you know, Spanish language parts of the Caribbean, but was actually interested in English, you know, language parts of the Caribbean. And again, I was mentioning about this sort of the way that Hollywood organized itself geographically and regionally. Um, the interesting thing about um, labor with Cuba, of course, is that labor was very regulated, you know, in a moment where you had a lot of union strife and a lot of interest in labor unions and pushing back against these things. It Warner Brothers, when it built its first theater there, uh, the Warner Theater at the famous Radio Centro, it discovered that you couldn't really control labor practices very well. And this is something that I'm sure um, Hollywood enjoyed in foreign markets was the ability to hire and fire and set prices however they wanted. Cuba's uh, Ministry of Labor was very highly regulated and you had to um, seek relief if you wanted to fire employees, even if they were caught cheating, if they were caught stealing. And so in many cases, um, they would be then subject to inquiries within the Ministry of Labor. So yeah, there was it was a very um, complex market, no doubt, no question. That um, Hollywood's entrance into Cuba was in, was troubled because the political system in Cuba was changing so often, and there was always regime change. There was always even change within labor laws. The unions were having battles, uh, sometimes even with each other. And then the other thing that was happening, of course, is the revolution. And so Paramount, uh, not Paramount, excuse me, Warner Brothers was not uh, active in Cuba for very long. Their um, beautiful cinema, which is now the Cine Yara, um, they were there for only a few years. And so by the time the revolution came, Par uh, Warner Brothers had pulled out of that cinema. And so it was a short-lived foray. And, that, and that's sort of the interesting thing about the, about the book, which is that this phenomenon, in some cases I just mentioned, um, there were countries where Fox could exist for 52 years, and there were other countries where they could exist for two. Um, it's just, it just depended. And that's what's so interesting and yet was incredibly challenging to figure out how to put this book together was the incredible differences um, in from market to market, from uh, theater to theater. And I think that's kind of the thing that's interesting about the book. People often ask me, well, what was the overarching strategy for Hollywood? And it's like, well, there wasn't one. I mean, the, the, the strategy was expansion, but every single market and every single period required different kinds of, of, of calculations. And so sometimes it was, again, like with Fox, buy chains en masse, sometimes with MGM Paramount, build one cinema only. And sometimes it was to ride out political storms. And sometimes it was to ride right into them. And did they stay in Cuba after the revolution? No, no, they did not. And nobody and, no, and, none, and none of the Hollywood majors did either. No, that was definitely not something they did. It all began, ran under Kaik after that. Um, the cinemas, everything was regulated, distribution and exhibition. But it's part of the sort of, uh, I think I referred to that that section as Hollywood's Caribbean's dreams. You know, it had these ideas about what it wanted to do uh, in Jamaica and certainly what it wanted to do in, in Cuba. And Cuba was probably one of the more disappointing uh, because at one point, even Lowe's MGM was going to build this huge office building for all of the Hollywood studios to operate inside. It was going to have this massive theater chain connected to it. It never got built. Um, uh, Egypt is another one of those complicated areas where where they had a lot of dreams and not all of them came to fruition. Same thing, I mean, political. I mean, a lot of this, and this is sort of goes back to the conversation about what cultural embassy and what is the meaning of these buildings is that you place a building like this in a moment of philo Americanism and people flock to it and they love it. You place a building like this in the middle of, of anti-Western, anti-American kind of ideas and it's the number one target. It's the most visible expression of American cultural expansion and even industrial expansion um, on your street. Mm. Uh, speaking of Egypt, let's talk about the Middle East. I'm from Iran myself, uh, and I was really hoping to find something. The Iran is mentioned just once, but the chapter in the Middle East, about Middle East is mainly focused on Egypt and Israel. And uh, he included the picture of Anwar Sadat, who is not the president at that time, with the head of MGM, if I'm not mistaken, I forgot the um, yeah. Yes. Uh, so. And, and, and you, said, you just said it that uh, sometimes, you know, you put a symbol of American imperialism or American cultural domination area, which has these anti-American sentiments. And obviously, Egypt is one example. Uh, so can you talk about that place? What was this 
anti-Western backlash against Cairo. But uh, the, I, I just found it fascinating when you said that the Egyptian nationalism actually was a blessing or they helped uh, Hollywood's expansion. So it would be great if we could talk about these issues. Sure. Um, and by the way, sorry there wasn't uh, more no, on Iran. No, no, no worries. <laughs> Hollywood didn't build any cinemas in Iran. I had a very clear, like the, the book is like a clear mandate for me. If Hollywood owned it, built it, or leased it, it's in the book. If they distributed films to it, if it was their key cinema, but they didn't own it, build it, or lease it, it's not there. So there are even there are even countries where there's there are theaters called like the Paramount Theater, and yet it's not owned by Paramount, never was owned by Paramount. Not in the book, because well, it really was a, a clear distinction for me. It's quite very interesting you just mentioned. I live in Shiraz, which is a city in south part. I used to live there, which is a city in south parts of Iran. And uh, I, when I was a kid, I always used to go to my father's shop. And my father's shop is close to an intersection called Paramount. And there used to be a cinema there. It wasn't, I'm sure it wasn't American owned, but American cinema was quite popular there. And I never, ever thought about that until now that you just mentioned it. There was a cinema the intersection is called Paramount, but after the revolution, that cinema turned into a mosque. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I kind of have memories of that place when I was about eight or nine years old, but that mosque was just closed down, but it was a mosque. It wasn't a cinema, but you could see the big wall where they used to put the posters. And mm-hmm. <laughs> But instead of a poster, you had the name of a prophet or something on top of there. Yeah, but sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> just had to no, say no, this. No, no, well, I mean, and it's funny too, because just as an aside, I mean, it's such an interesting history between movie theaters and churches and mosques and synagogues because because they are literally referred to as the temple of the motion picture and they are organized like a traditional church, um, which is that they are, you have these kind of, right, these sort of pews and then you have this thing you look up to in a kind of like uh, beatific. And a lot of people who... Theater organists often came from churches and uh, architects sometimes did both. And so there is a weird, there's a very interesting connection. Um, and it's also a complicated connection point. But yeah, and Hamid Nafisi writes a really um, uh, tradition, there's this amazing article about the about the revolution and the switch from all those movie theaters to something else. Um, so yeah, that, that's, a, that's a distinction for me. So no Iran, but yeah, the, the context of... of Egypt and and Israel is really interesting. Um, one thing I didn't mention when we talked about the Gaumont Low Metro d- deal way back in the 20s between MGM and Gaumont, which is that Gaumont, the French company, had cinemas and distribution operations all the way through um, North Africa and the Middle East, you know, from literally from Algeria all the way to Syria. And so they were operating cinemas, even cinemas in, in Cairo. So, you know, MGM's sort of operations go back even to the 1920s. The principal part that I discuss in the book is the is the moment that MGM builds its first cinema in 1940 um, in Cairo and then takes us through the 1960s. And yes, um, you know, in the beginning under uh, Farouk and the Waft Party, you have a kind of um, you know a kind of colonial moment of of philo Western existence for some, but a huge backlash against this import of American culture, pushback against um, um, seen as the the real deleterious impact of the Western influence, you know, alcohol, um, drinking, um, uh, gambling, dancing, all these sorts of things, right as, as Cairo is becoming an incredibly modern place. And so there's a, there's a, a group called the uh, Young Egypt, Mr. Afatat, which is pushing back against principally movie theaters, often at this point, often owned by Greek exhibitors. So these were seen as foreign owned cinemas, but the Hollywood owned cinemas begins really in 1940 when MGM builds its first uh, cinema in Cairo. And it's, and MGM and Fox are the two companies that own cinemas in both Cairo and Alexandria through the forties and fifties. So from 40 until 45 um, during wartime, those cinemas are packed with British troops. They're packed with local uh, audiences. They're packed with politicians and uh, cosmopolitan, you know, traders and bureaucrats and everything you can imagine from uh, a growing um, cosmopolitan, you know, middle and upper class. As you move past the war and the rise of Zionism is pushing you increasingly towards um, a, a conflict within Egyptian society itself and within the Middle East that cinema becomes more complicated. And as the anti-monarchic kind of feelings grow, the first of those, there's it, that, that MGM cinema, the Cairo, this, 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 the cinema is attacked three times uh, in 1945, 47, and 52. 
And when I say attacked, sometimes it's just the doors get smashed. Sometimes there's actual bombings and there are people who are killed in the cinemas. So these are um, these are not uh, protest marches. These are quite um, virulent attacks against the cinema um, because, again, because against the monarchy, against the British, against uh, Zionism, against Hollywood's supposed support for Israel. And that's what happens three times in 45, 47, 52. It's the most violent outburst against American cinemas that you'll see around the world. But so that's what's happening on one side. You have this growth of, again, the Cairo Palace, which is um, Fox's cinema in Cairo. And you also have these metros that were growing up. On the other side, in uh, Palestine and soon Israel, what you have is a, a post-war desire by people like Spiros Skouras, who is the president of Fox International. You want uh, He wants to actually build cinemas in this new country as an opportunity to push back against communism and to uh, produce an opportunity for refugees and give and create infrastructure for the country by building um, theaters that also have uh, dentists and doctor's offices and retail centers. And he finds, of course, a Israeli government that is not very easily uh, adaptable to foreign investment. So it takes forever. I think that's a stated goal from about 1948 to 49. But the Fox Theater um, in Tel Aviv doesn't open until 1957. It takes that long to work out investments. There's rising labor costs. We go back to employment again, um, construction, import, you name it. It's a complication. And so Really, very little of this is, is very easy for people to work out. Spiros is, if you don't know Spiros Skouras, he's one of the most interesting figures. Um, I would argue he's one of the most interesting figures of the 20th century, but he's certainly one of the most interesting figures in Hollywood history, um, who is both brokering deals um, in Greece, Turkey, Egypt, Palestine, Israel. He's everywhere. Um, and he's a very political figure and he's very much a, and he's, but he's beloved. What's weird about Skurs and I think what his charm is, is that he's a huge favorite of the Egyptian government and he's a huge favorite of the Israeli government. He's raising money for, um, for investment in Israel at the same time that he's brokering deals for, uh, the, uh, for the, the Egyptian government. And later after some of that, uh, attacks, he employs a man named Fatih Ibrahim to work for him to help, uh, negotiate first for television um, deals for the Egyptian government to bring in television and television sets, as well as to negotiate all of these um, these cinemas and distribution contracts he has inside Egypt. So I think we often, and this is a point I make in the book, we often think of these things as very, you know, um, divided. Like there's Israeli, history, Israeli cinema history and Egyptian cinema history. And I think what I was trying to do in the book through, again, this kind of regional focus is to say, these things are really interrelated. Because what happened, for instance, with the Fox cinema in Tel Aviv was the Arab boycott against Israel actually got Fox to really bury the company identity. When you look at photographs of the Fox theater being built, which eventually was known as the Tel Aviv, it's very clearly Fox is all over the big signs in front of the construction site. But just before opening, I missed a big push by the Arab League against uh, in investment in Israel, they suddenly change the name of the cinema and they claim it's owned by this other company. The company turns out to be essentially an acronym for the three streets that enter um, right at that cinema. It's uh, because they don't want to have be seen as being um, uh, in, investing too heavily, but everyone knows that it's a it's a cinema that's owned by by Fox and operating within Tel Aviv. So what I was trying to do here was to change the conversation a little bit to not just about the shop window and the cultural embassy model was to really say these cinemas really represented the way you can see the changes. You can literally read the changes in politics in Cairo. You could see the changes um, against uh, sort of thinking about the United States in the Middle East about uh, about Hollywood, support for Israel, um, and also about um, a growing suspicion about Hollywood executives in amongst the the critiques and eventually even those attacks and, and, and on on the cinemas themselves, so I actually thought this this one piece of research, which was complicated, was really um, a fascinating way to, to think about how to read the Middle East in terms of its own film history. And your your last question was how did um, nationalizing Egyptian cinema actually benefit Hollywood? And that's a really interesting 
point, which I was surprised to find. So I think it's a well-known uh, story that, you know, Gabal Gabal Abdel Nasser, uh, he nationalized Egyptian cinema, and it was not an overwhelming success. A lot of the people who were put in place on the sort of nationally regulated cinema were not necessarily cinema people, and it led to some of the decline um, of, of Egyptian cinema, which had been the um, preeminent cinema in the Middle East, and far more people were watching Egyptian cinema in Egypt than were watching Hollywood. But it had a, an impact on the on the quality and the number of films that were being made in Egypt. But what was happening behind the scenes was there were a lot of new cinemas being built in in Egypt, and some of those cinemas were actually being um, Fox was being uh, essentially uh, given those cinemas to operate um, by the by the Nasser uh, government. And so um, you end up with a kind of um, a strange story that you'd think that that nationalization would be bad for Hollywood, but in fact was actually giving additional outlets for Fox to operate um, and was also kind of declining in industry, which is why many people, obviously distributors moved to to Beirut and why the, in the industry began shifting eastward. And that certainly didn't hurt Hollywood, um, which still looked at Egypt as an important market um, because, uh, well, it was. And how about uh, Israel? Israel also used cinema to combat socialism and communism. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I think we, I think we sometimes we have a very like uh, a slightly simplistic idea, maybe of kind of how things would look after World War II um, and after the bride. But of course, you know, you have at this point, you have a huge influx of of Jews coming from places like. Uh, Yemen and Algeria, mm-hmm. Morocco, as well as having European immigration coming in, and a lot of that European immigration was actually coming with uh, certainly with um, some with socialism as their uh, political identity, some with communism as their political identity. So Hollywood wasn't just finding wasn't just finding an open market in Israel that was super excited about having Hollywood. They were finding places where people were outraged that. Uh, that America was involved in the Korean War. They were finding American foreign policy to be uh, to be negative. They were, you know, and because they were sometimes uh, communists, so they were absolutely opposed to American ideology, certainly from its cinemas. So again, what Skouris and others sort of decided was that the more of these outlets we build and the more newsreels and movies we get out into the world in this direction, the more we can transmit the values of American democracy, consumer culture, uh, push back against, you know, the the growth of, of the Soviet Union, which had its own designs on influence in Egypt and Israel and all these other places. And you see that in the African continent, too, which was also part of what Hollywood was doing down there. I mean, so I mean, just as an example, to go way back to your first question, um, this book took a really long time because um, it's just you you end up in each one of these places, at least I did not trying to answer the question necessarily is what's Hollywood doing in China? The question is what is China doing to Hollywood and how does Hollywood try to navigate its way through what China is up to in this period? And that shifts all the time. Um, So I think the complication with, with the researches and kind of figuring out the story is that uh, so for instance, Egypt's interests and priorities in 1940 are very different than they were uh, after Nagib and Nasser. And so you're telling one story, but the story is shifting and Hollywood's trying its best to figure out how to uh, use its own industry and logic. It's trying to figure out how to employ when it can the State Department, and Commerce Department to help them in definitely in times of trouble. And it's trying to also transmit to the local citizenry. Um, you still want to come here and uh, figuring out how to do a multi-generational attraction, you know, to the adults and to the kids, which is a story that I, I talk about in terms of, especially with India and Egypt about this Metro Cub Club, which is all geared to kids because, you know, you're, you're trying to forecast, yes, I want kids coming from these places in the 1940s, but I want them to be adults going to my movie theaters in the 1960s. Uh, another really interesting part of the book was cinemas during the Second World War, especially in France and Nazi occupation. And I find it quite fascinating that these cinemas were also used as a base for French uh, resistance. Uh, so it would be great if you could talk about that aspect of the book. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, sometimes it was, um, I would take a, every now and then a slight detour from the book because you, you, you know, it's, I think it's inevitable you find some kind of incredible narratives. One of those was of the Le Paramount, which was the main movie house that Paramount built in Paris in, in 1927, 
Um, you know, and it, it had been run by uh, Andre Ullman and Rene Le Breton, uh, from the 20s and into the 30s. And their projectionist, Ernest Bechet, was also a very important figure. And so the cinema operated through the 20s and 30s, as you would imagine, as the shop window cinema for Paramount's films and all the Paramount films opened there. And then the war breaks out. And, you know, Ullman and Bechet, they all head to the front. Some are captured. Um, eventually, they all return um, to the to the Paramount. And at that point, it's a Nazi-occupied Paris. And the Paramount becomes a location of a small cell of an underground operation, which is um, taking parachuters coming in off of the rooftops and transmitting mail. And what happens over the over the next few years is that this is all being done clandestinely um, without the, the Nazi occupation understanding that this is happening within the cinema. Paramount loses all contact with the Paramount. So it's a strange thing that Paramount is no longer run by the Paramount. And actually in Paramount's own international news, they talk about we've lost contact with our with our friends and colleagues. We don't know what's happening to them. We hope they're safe. Um, and so eventually um, Bichet is is found out. There's a there's someone that's arrested elsewhere and they 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 figure out that Bichet is the key to this whole operation. Then they bring him in, they beat him and torture him and eventually they send him off uh, to a to a camp. To Buchenwald, and um, he's there, and um, and just by chance, as the uh, camp is being liberated, he actually is seen by a newsreel cameraman who recognizes him, and that cameraman, uh, Gaston Madru, is one of the most famous uh, cameramen of the MGM uh, News of the Day, and Madru uh, uh, takes a photo of him, sends him back to Paris with his negatives. Um, and his photographs, and Madru is killed almost immediately in Leipzig right after this, and is celebrated for being one of the most famous and important newsreel photographers in Paris who had captured all kinds of footage with his, um, he had a bicycle where he would actually um, keep with a bunch of bottles. He would actually have a clandestine camera so he could bike around Paris and capture Nazis and um, the occupation. And so what this story kind of told me about this whole clandestine operation, which then was much celebrated afterwards by de Gaulle and certainly by Paramount was that these cinemas were, again, you go back to employment and labor. One of the things that was often talked about with them was how much they loved America and they loved not just because America was employing them or because this, because they were part of this international operation. So you have these employees who are French, but they are, almost uh, quasi-American because of the way that they work every single day for an American company for with American operations and American films. And so that underground operation was really a, a kind of, a, I think, a, for me, a kind of consecration of the idea that the cultural embassy has these people who work underneath, you know, the American operation, but they are part of the foreign, you know, the foreign operations of Hollywood staff. And um, the other piece about the World War II is really um, how much these cinemas were kind of battlegrounds themselves. And um, so if you're down in Brazil, you're looking at uh, UFA, the German film company. UFA is trying to establish cinemas so that it can show Nazi newsreels and Nazi films. You have Hollywood films there to show Hollywood newsreels and Hollywood films. And so exhibition and movie theaters become yet another way in which the kind of ideological struggles are being battled out. Now we often talk about, yes, of course, these films were distributed here and distributed there. But in fact, what I think is kind of important sometimes about looking at exhibition is exhibition. When you look at a specific movie theater is actually where, you know, it was transmitted, not a kind of theoretical idea of they distributed that film to France. Like it actually went to this theater. It was actually in that neighborhood and that neighborhood had a number of French, German, Jews, you name it. So you actually can kind of understand the context of distribution of these kinds of things. Or if you knew, for instance, that um, the MGM newsreel was always going to be seen by um, by the king, uh, because the king, King Farouk, for instance, would always come to see, he had a special chair they would bring in for him. And so the, the king would always have a special chair. It gave you a sense that there was some impact of what was going on, and that impact was happening in this kind of granular level at a specific movie theater. And I think all these anecdotes kind of give you a kind of tapestry of a huge history we still don't know much about. And I would love to tell you that my 
very long book would tell you that entire history, which is that how and why did Hollywood, why, how and why did the world love Hollywood films? If they did, and how and why did the world come to hate Hollywood and hate, hate the United States? I mean, it's like, it, it, one of the things that you sort of get with this is that um, this is where a lot of that love and hate begins is inside the movie theater and these sort of tall tales in these movie theaters, these luxury appointed, you know, chandeliered and upholstered seated movie houses that were selling a kind of idea. And when people love the United States, they love that idea. And when they began to hate their own government, especially that government was in league with the United States, these movie theaters were, uh, these were the den, these were dens of sin and, uh, and, and oppression. And I think that's why they're so interesting to look at. Uh, and what Hollywood thought it could do by operating them. And uh, when you were speaking about uh, cinemas being used as a resistance base, I, I was reminded of, there were, I guess, movies about this. Uh, I was reminded of Truffaut's famous movie, Last Metro, you know, where the, who was the actress? I forgot she was, she was a huge icon anyway. Yeah, that uh, she was operating this cinema, but at the same time, people were hiding in the basement. And I guess her husband was also like a resistant fighter was hiding, hiding in the basement. Uh, how about China? The situation in China is also very interesting. How did Chinese Revolution American uh, affect American cinemas there? And how does this relationship work these days? Because still there are, I guess, American-owned cinemas operating there. Well, the Chinese example is one of the more interesting. I mean, I think they're all they're all interesting because all these <laughs> countries are so fascinating, and and Hollywood's interest in them is as well. But I, the Chinese example goes all the way back to the 1930s, when MGM again was was operating, um, co-operating the, the, the Roxy uh, in Shanghai, and then after the after World War II, um, it came back and began to uh, operate fully the the Roxy in Shanghai, and actually began to build its own cinemas, which never actually happened. And the problem for, um, for MGM and for Hollywood was, of course, the, the revolution, right? So the, the Chinese revolution comes and that's the end of Hollywood. Literally, Hollywood films were not really legally distributed in China um, for the most part, from 1950 to about, well, the, the 1999, the World Trade Organization uh, agreements, because um, even though there was some beginning of that happening in the 1990s with Warner Brothers, which had worked out a few deals, um, there was a sort of an absolute kind of blackout of Hollywood distribution and exhibition, of course, um, in China during that period. The post um, WTO moment in the 2000s, and I imagine that's what you're asking about principally, is how did this more current moment work? There uh, was a, a, one of the most <clears throat> important and famous exhibitors in U.S. history, Salah Hassanin, uh, who used to run United Artists Theaters and actually started his career <clears throat> in Egypt, actually working for Fox, and then came to the United States. He was the first person to run a company called Warner Brothers International Theaters, which began in 1987. And Warner Brothers International Theaters had a very smart idea. The idea was, we have a number of markets which need higher prices. We need to have a number of markets which need more Hollywood films. We have a number of markets that are going to be opening up in the kind of what people could see was going to be a post Cold War moment. And we need to partner with local exhibitors and we will have a global chain of Warner Brothers theaters profiting from our branding, profiting from our technology, our management know-how and all of the usual kind of salesmanship, if you will, of Hollywood exhibition. And Warner Brothers International Theaters under Hassanen and then eventually under Millard Oaks um, moved into China in the late 1990s as the Chinese market began opening. And the Chinese market desperately, desperately needed movie theaters. Um, so many theaters in the 80s and 90s were, were closed down and torn down because they were subpar, or because they had gone out of favor. And the Chinese government, along with its huge, massive um, rise in the economy, wanted to use movie theaters as a way to essentially establish a new um, vitality and also to basically say, we've arrived, we have large malls, we have large real estate development complexes, and we have a large middle class and a middle class goes to the movies. And so companies like Dali and Wanda worked with Warner Brothers to build cinemas in large retail complexes in Guangzhou to um, Shanghai, Beijing, you name it. So in smaller cities, bigger cities, second tier cities, there were cinemas growing everywhere under the with the Warner Brothers branding, and that included both 
Daffy Duck and Humphrey Bogart mixed with local um, uh, Chinese stars and Chinese stardom. So this was a, worked very well in the beginning because there were um, because Warner Brothers was very excited about this. It actually moved its headquarters um, and moved its design headquarters to China. It had sort of thrown all in for China. And then the Chinese government, for reasons that have never exactly been stated officially, changed its ideas about how much principal investment, this is very key. Uh, Warner Brothers was always supposed to be a minority investor, so say like 49%. And then they suddenly were granted the ability to have a controlling interest in their own stake in China. And something happened and they changed that idea. When they changed the idea that um, Warner Brothers would always sort of be in second position at companies and theaters with its own name, uh, they pulled out. They sold the cinema chain, they moved out of China. Um, other companies have stayed in. So one thing that that's important to know is that while Warner Brothers pulled out, IMAX, a Canadian company, has maintained its presence and continued to grow in China. Uh, CJCGV, a Korean company, they're still very well placed throughout China. Um, and many companies are, but Warner Brothers is not. And actually was the beginning of the um, the sort of slow but eventual ev- evaporation of the Warner Brothers International Cinemas chain as it was renamed. Um, its last cinema chain, it sold off in Japan in 2013. But that later period is very different somewhat than the earlier period where there was this idea about creating these kind of shop windows in international cities. This was a really part of a kind of um, the expansiveness of global chains in the 1980s and 90s, companies like UCI and AMC um, that were all about having very large dominant um global cinema chains. But Warner Brothers was important because it was going to establish Hollywood's presence overseas. And it was doing that in a very American kind of way. And so as an example of that, um, it was important to have them in the book as a sort of coda, um, as the last studio that still wanted to have be involved in in foreign exhibition. There are currently, that does not exist anymore. It's not existed now for a decade. Um, And I don't actually imagine it ever will again. Um, I'm sure at some point someone picks up this podcast in 40 years, they'll think I was uh, insane when they find out that, you know, the, the 3000 cinemas of Paramount around the world, uh, would laugh at my, at my, uh, estimation, but it's unlikely, um, that studios will get involved in foreign exhibition again, but you can never say never in this crazy business. Uh, before ending this conversation, is there any other book or project you're currently working on? Yeah. Um, so I, one of the things I'm really excited about working on is expanding um, the work I was doing in in, in Africa on the African continent. Um, we didn't talk about that too much, but one of the things that's really, um, you know, I think a sort of a shameful part of Hollywood's history is that from 1956 until 1969, um, Fox owned the dominant theater chain in South Africa, colonial Zimbabwe, and uh, Kenya. And those were all racially segregated uh, cinemas. And so um, I looked at a lot of the operations in um, various places on the African continent, again, from those three countries um, and into West Africa, um, as well as in places like uh, Ethiopia. And so I'd like to begin, uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is actually expanding my examination of Hollywood's operations in in Africa beyond just exhibition, but thinking about location shooting, distribution, TV, um, what has the continent been, especially in the sub-Saharan context, what has the continent meant to Hollywood? What were those those interests? And there are a a number of amazing scholars who work in this area, like Laura Fair and James Burns and Charles Ambler and so many others. And I hope to sort of, uh, sort of lean on their shoulders as I try to look around for some of the pieces of the story that I wasn't able to put into this book, but I think are um, really fascinating and tell us something about uh, investment on the continent, especially now when uh, Chinese investment is so ascendant. I think it's kind of interesting to think about um, an historical investment in the continent and the differences between the kind of geopolitical moment of the 20th century and the moment of the 21st. Uh, thank you very much, Russ, for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, absolutely enjoyed this conversation and I strongly encourage our audience to pick up the book. Uh, the good thing about the book is that it's kind of geographically organized, so you can look at the areas that you're interested in. For example, I was interested really in the Middle East and also I uh, lived for some time in New Zealand and Australia, so they were my favorite chapters to know what happened in those areas. So thank you very much for uh, for your time. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.